Thank you so much, Katie, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for having me. I would especially like to thank the staff and faculty organizers for making this visit possible. Uh, today, I will present some work in progress, mainly coming from a chapter in a book that I'm working on. And I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Writing in her blog in 2017, transgender writer and activist Julia Serrano said the following. If you happen to be one of those people who are concerned for the seemingly sudden appearance of transgender children, then the following graph should really freak you out. <laughs> this graph, adapted from psychologist Chris Manis' 2009 book, Right Hand, Left Hand, shows an S-shaped rise in rates of left-handedness across each year of birth among a sample of over 1 million Americans surveyed in 1986. Only 2-4% two, two of survey takers who were born before 1905 reported being left-handed. The graph conveys a pretty steep rise in left-handedness among people born between 1900 and around 1945, after which this, the rate of this trait stabilized at around 10 to 14% of respondents. As Serrano notes, this rise in left-handedness generally coincided with the lifting of rules in schools that had previously forced students to write with their right hands only. Serrano shared this chart of left-handedness rates in response to a spate of sensationalist articles and cover stories published around 2017 by high profile British and Irish magazines, including The Sun and The Irish Sun and The Daily Mail, each containing allegations or insinuations that minors are being unduly encouraged to identify as transgender in their schools and other places. The Sun accompanied another story titled Transgender Agenda with a claim that the number of children referred to gender identity clinics in Britain has quadrupled in the past five years. Until very recently, zero censuses and few institutions collected data on transgender people or on any other group of people whose gender does not statically correspond to one of two sex categories, men or women from birth onward. Nevertheless, journalists and activists often leverage the limited data available on how many transgender people there are to shore up firsthand accounts about what they perceive to be happening in schools, healthcare systems, and other core civic institutions, along with suggestions of what should be happening in these places. People sympathetic to transgender rights continue to share variations of this left-handedness chart particularly in response to a new wave of anti-trans social and legal movements that claim transgender identity is some sort of mental illness that spreads through social contagion in schools and over the internet. In a 2022 episode of Last Week Tonight, TV host John Oliver shared a version of this chart in response. Here, Oliver is creating a connection between left-handedness and trans identity that reflects a core conviction now common among many liberal-leaning people who are sympathetic to LGBTQ rights. Gender identity, like left-handedness, is a characteristic that people are born with. Oliver also emphasized the plateau in this graph, implicitly promising that even if numbers rise temporarily, they will eventually level out and trans people will remain a tiny numerical minority. I have made a simple graph that corresponds to the left-handedness charts shared by Serrano and Oliver, displaying estimated rates of identification as transgender by years of birth. Data come from a pooled set of surveys collected by the CDC between, the, between 2014 and 2023 in 44 US states. Each point on the x-axis represents the estimated average rate of trans identification among people grouped in 10-year cohorts, starting with people born in 1935 up until 2004. Among respondents born between 1935 and 1944, often referred to as the latter half of the silent generation, around 
per, uh, percent responded yes when the following survey question was asked. Do you consider yourself to be transgender? Meanwhile, among respondents born between 1995 and 2004, often referred to as members of Generation Z, around 1.7% answered yes when asked the same question. This is a rate over five times as high. Again, left-handedness rose around four to seven fold over the course of 40 years. How far can this comparison go? In my book project, I am arguing that there are vital theoretical and political questions that this rudimentary and political empirical metaphor cannot actually address. Social scientists and civil rights advocates alike must nevertheless begin to tackle the broader questions this raises. These questions center around who is more likely to identify as trans now than in the past, and how trans identity might be distributed in populations over time. Do the theories and analytical tools we use to discuss trans identity change if trans people become 2% of the population as opposed to less than 1%? How do they change if trans people eventually begin to comprise 5, 10, or 20% of the population? as is sometimes estimated for new generations in terms of sexual orientation. Do our theories change if only certain people in these populations are transitioning at higher rates? These questions are already playing a pivotal role in a key shift in how and where key struggles over LGBTQ plus civil rights are taking place in liberal democracies, including in the highly racialized context of the United States. A 2020 U.S. Supreme Court decision, Bostock versus Clayton County, formally banned anti-gay and anti-trans discrimination in the workplace. As sociologist Michael Rosenfeld notes in his book, The Rainbow After the Storm, the dissenting opinions in this landmark case are interesting from the way they distance themselves from outright support of anti-gay and anti-trans discrimination. Rosenfeld notes, that Alito and Kavanaugh's dissents, in, they, they, in, in them, they framed their positions as being otherwise sympathetic to LGBTQ people, but unfortunately bound by some other conviction, such as the separation of powers or freedom of speech. While plenty of anti-LGBT discrimination obviously persists, it does appear that at least from a formal legal perspective, the sun is setting on state-sanctioned discrimination against people for being trans, gay, or lesbian. Instead, I argue that the focus has shifted towards fights over the rights and resources for people who might eventually become trans, which is where the population politics of trans life come to the forefront. In each year since 2020, the number of anti-trans laws introduced at the federal, state, and local levels has broken all-time records. 2024 is on track to keep up and we're barely done with January. These measures largely focus on the rights and institutional surroundings of children and young people, including school bathrooms, sports teams, and gender affirming care. I refer to young people in addition to children because some of this legislation seeks to prevent access to gender affirming care for adults as old as 20 and 25. Even among adults, Legislators and officials seek to introduce additional financial, logistical, and emotional obstacles along the path towards getting to live everyday life as a trans person. If the increased prevalence of left-handedness was spurred by the end of efforts to coerce people into writing with their left hand in the right hands, the increased prevalence of trans identity is paradoxically unfolding in tandem with a surge in efforts to block some perceived points of entry. But in a post-Bostock socio-legal landscape, one in which outright clinical conversion therapy for individuals has low public support and is banned in a growing number of US states, how do those pursuing their measures legitimize their political project? Recent advocates of these policies typically shy away from arguing that they would like to suppress something that arises naturally like left-handedness in some percentage of the population. 
Instead, they allege, like Abigail Schreier does in this best-selling book, that at least among some people, trans identity does not arise naturally and inexplicably, but does so unnaturally due to undue social influence, invoking terms like trans trenders and social contagion. This is where the question about who is identifying as transgender has come into the forefront of a new chapter in trans politics. In this book uh, called Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters, in which she alleges there is a contemporary trans epidemic among teenage girls, Schreier points to the fact that in the 2010s, rates of clinical referrals for gender dysphoria were far more common among children who were assigned male at birth. But as this pattern has flipped in the 2020s, as gender dysphoria referrals are now more common among children who were assigned female at birth. Although this pattern did not show up in my early analysis based on data from 2014 through 2019, once I include data going up to 2023, it does seem that the pattern Schreier describes using clinical referral data maps into data that I'm using, which includes people who are not necessarily pursuing any form of medical transition. This is just people identifying as trans. But sex assigned at birth is not the only demographic characteristic that Shry is concerned about. She also suggests that the transgender craze is disproportionately affecting white teens. Schreier speculates that the recent uptick in trans identification is at least partially due to white students on college campuses seeking to obtain some sort of marginalized status in order to escape whiteness, which she calls the most reviled identity on today's campuses. Why be trans? Schreier suggests that unlike other identities, trans identity is entirely voluntary and requires very little. In her words, they can't choose to be people of color. Most can't choose to be gay nor can they choose to be disabled, though they may be inclined to milk whatever setbacks they have endured. While Schreier's allegation is certainly polemic, it also evokes a boogeyman character of the, caricature of the welfare state, in which setbacks are there to be opportunistically milked through fraud, and that anything that might have a social component is also sinister. I think that it's interesting from a population perspective that there's an implicit link that critics like Schreier are making between social explanations for population changes and sinister explanations for population changes. As social scientists, we are well equipped to provide social accounts of population changes that need not assume that the social elements are sinister. The question before us is what to make of a more fully social account of gender which many of us perhaps strategically still treat in our day-to-day -day practice and description as an immutable characteristic. We might acknowledge that gender is socially constructed, but what about tackling how gender might be socially distributed? My book takes its title from a concept that I believe is essential to navigating the rapidly evolving debates surrounding gender identity in the 21st century, the social distribution of gender. I first started exploring this idea in a uh, 2022 AJS paper, which was based on a cross-sectional birthist data collected between 2014 and 2019. I now have four more years of data from the same source, and I'm hoping that the book format will give me more space in which to flesh out the mechanisms that I see happening or the series of mechanisms that shape how gender is being distributed in the 21st century. In today's talk, I will give an overview of some of the overall cohort findings, especially the updated ones, but then I will dig deeper into some of the new findings related to race and ethnicity that were not available to, due to sample size constraints in the earlier study. A larger sample size has allowed me to develop what was previously a comparison between two crudely simplified groups, white and non-white, with into a more detailed but still imperfect comparison of a larger number of racial and ethnic groups. Data come from the CDC's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, often given the very attractive nickname BRFIS, 
Burfus, is, that's not me having indigestion, <laughs> is a state-based telephone survey that collects data on health outcomes and is one of the first major population-based surveys to collect expansive data on whether or not respondents identify as transgender. Not every state asked about gender identity every year, so I pulled samples drawn from 44 out of 50 states collected between 2014 and early 2023 yielding a sample of nearly 2 million respondents born between 1935 and 2004, and over 9,000 of them are transgender. In this study, I use gender identity as the outcome of interest. And in the Burfus survey, this is measured by asking respondents two questions. The first asks, do you consider yourself to be transgender? If a respondent answers yes, they are then asked if they are male to female, female to male, or gender nonconforming. These are not the terms that I would use, but this is the, the terminology used in the survey. The, these terms do allow me, though, to compare cohort differences based on sex assigned at birth, which is obviously a point of interest for many people. And it allows me to compare patterns between trans people in this uh, survey and their cisgender counterparts. Because of the question wording, however, I cannot make any assumptions about gender assigned at birth of the respondents who responded that they were gender nonconforming, but I am able to, to break down cohort trends for identifying as gender nonconforming down by race and ethnicity and college attendance. This is by no means a perfect way of asking a gender question, but it is, I argue, a sociologically useful one, and I'm happy to discuss the analytic choices I made while working with these data in the Q&A. The Burfus, like many questions, has been in the process of changing how it asks respondents about racial and ethnic identities, but it seems to ask three questions, three core questions. An introductory question about whether one is Hispanic or not, followed by a question that asks respondents to select all that apply from a number of broad categories, and a question of, about which one would you say best represents your race. Beginning in 2022, the ability to be identified as multiracial or as someone belonging to the category of other appears to have been removed. Uh, but this is, these are the data I'm working with, but I'm very hopeful to hear what you know, people might recommend about how to analyze. Uh, but when analyzing social change, it's important to consider that people born at different times will have different experiences of the same events. So I will look at differences in identification as trans or as gender nonconforming between respondents born in different birth cohorts alongside differences by year. Popular generational definitions that we are used to using like baby boomers certainly capture some shared experiences. But in this study, I chose to remain agnostic towards the boundaries of these generations. And so I coded cohorts in 10 year increments starting from the first year of birth in the data set, 1935. For my AJS article, I created a play on an Alexis diagram to demonstrate how some key events in trans history may have been experienced differently along the life course of members of the various cohorts in the study. In order to think about what I might expect to mark these differences, I draw from historical work by writers like Susan Stryker, Jules Gill Peterson, and C. Riley Snorton, who have all emphasized that in the early half of the 20th century, mass representations of trans people tended to mainly focus on white transgender women, such as Christine Jorgensen, who had a media blitz. It's the first documented uh, event in this crude Lexus diagram variation. Uh, however, as they point out, there were also later key historical inflection points where Black people, Latino people, Asian people played key roles such as in the Compton's Cafeteria Riot in 1966 San Francisco, which was a precursor to the Stonewall Riots. Seemingly unrelated historical events have also had effects on the development of trans history. 9-11, the 9-11 attacks and the renewed importance of identity documents for state surveillance led to the development of a significant trans legal movement expressly devoted to the legal recognition of gender change. For the book, I'm planning to update this diagram to better reflect the advent of the internet and smartphones and social media, 
which obviously or undoubtedly played a role in shaping trans history to some extent. But another important date to look at is 2014, when Time magazine announced that the US had reached a transgender tipping point. Since this survey is primarily concerned with identifying potential patterns in the social distribution of gender that might be evident when we compare cohorts and periods, the results I talk about here are based on predicted probabilities and average discrete changes estimated through survey weighted logistic regressions, and I'm happy to talk about the weighting and modeling approach in the Q&A. But for quick reference, I had initially started with a simple cohort-based plot that seeks to emulate the plot of left-handedness that we started this presentation with. Once we separate the cohort patterns to account for the survey year, a few patterns pop out. Uh, the black is, or gray, is gener the, the most recent cohort, uh, the, is, which was born after 1995. Um, and so black shows the predicted probabilities of identifying as trans among people born between 1995 and 2004. These are often called late millennials or generation Z. Here, I will call them the tipping point generation. Orange shows the probability of identifying as trans among people born between 1985 and 94, firmly millennials. And purple shows the rates for people born between 1975 and 1984, often known as late Gen X. Although members of these three cohorts appear to be more significant, more likely to identify as trans in comparison to members of birth cohorts before them, it's truly among this tipping point cohort in which we can see the most significant increases over time. This cohort reached age 18 between 2013 and 2022, marked by events such as the hailing of the transgender tipping point, but also the Trump presidency and the COVID-19 pandemic. But there's truly no way to give an account of transgender life in the United States without taking race and ethnicity into account. <laughs> Given how racialized crucial elements in trans history and the social networks in which they were lived have been in terms of media coverage, access to medical care, policing, and overall class differences. Work by Jules Gill Peterson and C. Riley Snorton underscores stories of both substantial structural disadvantages, but also stories of joy and community in which trans people of color have been central actors in shaping key moments in trans history. In, form in forming a hypothesis for how race and ethnicity impacts this change that we are seeing, I made a few initial assumptions. The main one was that a history marked by relatively high visibility of white transgender people in mainstream news coverage in comparison to the relative invisibility of non-white people would be reflected in the overall gender distribution patterns. This is taking seriously the consideration that being able to see oneself reflected in the political, in the popular media shapes the types of lives one can see as possible for oneself. Consider the following reflection offered by the late award-winning trans blogger, Monica Roberts. I had the perception when I was five or six that something was different of me. I always saw British stories of Caroline Cossey and stories of Renee Richards, but never anything about people that looked like me. Elsewhere in the interview, Monica speculated about what her life would have looked like if the trans people who featured prominently in, her pub in the public life of her formative years had not been exclusively white. Because I didn't see people like me, I wondered where they were and realized they were there, but well hidden. If I had been open, if I had had open out and proud peers, I would have transitioned earlier than 1994. As philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah has noted, the desire for visible role models to look like me is a common trope in, contemporary, in the contemporary cultural zeitgeist, often laden with paradoxes, since few people look exactly alike, and people who use this term are usually selecting one axis of physical similarity or dissimilarity to emphasize over many others. Appiah argues that this is as much about aspiration as identification, we say that their characters look like us, maybe what we mean is that we wish to look like them, positing that people who seek out physical resemblance in popular representations and portrayals 
are also active in renegotiating what is possible for their own lives. The social milieus we navigate condition the pathways along which gender is distributed. And these social milieus are often heavily conditioned by racialized contexts. Nevertheless, these racialized contexts vary significantly over time and place. Media editor and television producer Janet Mock grew up in a very different social milieu than Monica Roberts. She grew up Hawaiian and Black in Honolulu. Janet would grow up with other trans peers in her life alongside teachers and mentors who were mahu, a category of gender variant people recognized within indigenous Hawaiian culture. Citing the unique social context of the 1990s Oahu, where multiculturalism was the norm, Maka describes an environment that enabled strong intergenerational encounters and bonds to take place. Speaking about a friend, Wendy and I were low-income trans girls of color. We didn't have many resources, but what we were blessed with was being at the right place at the right time. Hawaii's community of trans women was vast and knowledgeable. There was a deep legacy of trans womanhood passed on to us by older women who had been exactly where we were. While popular culture also had some role in shaping Mock's life, she describes growing up far less conditioned by white representation than in the formative years Monica Roberts describes while growing up two decades prior in Texas. But what do the best estimates of trans prevalence look like if we break them down by the racial and ethnic groups people are referencing when they are describing the opportunities they either had or did not have to live lives as trans people at different points in their lives. This plot here shows the predicted probabilities of identifying as trans by birth cohort, but this time it's broken down by whether one answered that they were non-Hispanic white or not. As you can see, all observed cohorts up until, in, in, up until 1995 Non-white people are identifying as trans at higher rates than white people, highlighted in red. However, after the 1995 cohort, white people are more likely to identify as trans than non-white people. When we take the non-white group and break it down into the different categories that are available to us with the BRFSS, and now I'm able to do this thanks to the larger sample size, we can see that this pattern holds for Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black Americans. Rates of identifying as trans increase, ac importantly, across all groups. But by the 1985 cohort, the rates of trans identification among white Americans already began to exceed those of Black Americans, while slightly trailing behind those of Hispanic Americans. Interestingly, in the 1965 and 1975 cohorts, rates of trans identification among Hispanics appear to grow relative to both black and white Americans. This is something not generally covered in a lot of the trans hist history and uh, finding that was also surprising to me now that I have more uh, detailed information. For ease of reading, I've also included some of the smaller N demographic groups in the sample, but I'm only here comparing to trans identifications among, among whites. Here I compare Asian Americans to white Americans where there's also higher rates of trans identification across most cohorts up until 1985. Here uh, I compare multiracial Americans to non-multiracial white Americans and the rates of identification in this group at, towards the end do not exceed those of whites. And this might reflect the fact that in that last year of the survey, it did not include the multiracial Options. So maybe, you know, that later part of the survey, uh, it might be important to consider the role that the responses of the most recent years play in these estimates beyond controlling per year. And then this, oh, wait, I, 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 the, this is the findings among uh, American Indians. And so it also does, it does not, it, this is an exception to the overall pattern, but the historical, oh, no, it, it actually goes along with the rest of the overall pattern. Overall, my findings corroborate a broader pattern that first took me by surprise when I looked at these data for the AJS paper. Visibility does not always translate into biographical availability, to borrow Doug McAdams' words. <clears throat> 
I find that trans people of color have existed in high numbers, even if they were not always adequately represented. I find evidence of a robust presence of trans identification in early cohorts among American Indian, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and multiracial Americans as captured by this imperfect survey. But crucially, I find that among these groups, the rates of trans identification were significantly higher than that of white respondents until the most recent cohort, born after 1995. While this chapter is still very much a work in progress and the data I'm presenting are not detailed enough to completely pin down a particular social mechanism, I am proposing that we are perhaps seeing some traces on the wall of the social mechanisms that are out there that we can continue exploring once, the, once we can collect better data. It is only among Generation Z, which came of age during and after this transgender tipping point, where the the, where the structurally advantaged group is becoming more likely to identify as trans than the structurally less advantaged group, even though trans identity has become more prevalent across the board. In other words, across several generations, members of the US's traditionally dominant racial group appear to have been less likely to adopt cutting edge gender identities until these gender identities began to uh, acquire some degree of mainstream visibility and acceptance. This reminds me about some of the work that Damon Santola is doing on, so, on the role of influencers, for example. The people who are the most visible are not typically the ones innovating. By the time they have taken some sort of trend, by the time Taylor Swift has you know, endorsed veganism, it will have been, uh, you know, once a lot of people on the periphery of the social network have also endorsed ve veganism, she is not likely to become, you know, the leading advocate because people at the at the more central role in their social networks are much more concerned with what other people will be seeing. And so I'll explain a little bit narrative wise about how this might be. While trans people positioned at the bottom of racialized social hierarchies may face major challenges in terms of visibility and legibility, people closer to the top of these hierarchies, like I've said, face an altogether separate set of pressures, including pressures to conform to whatever social norms are expected to maintain their positions of advantage. Janet Mock describes traveling to Thailand for gender affirming surgery and recalls meeting an older white Australian woman named Jeannie. Jeannie was older than Mock, and she appeared to have been far more socially and economically advantaged. However, Jeannie appears to have waited far longer than she would have wanted to come out as a trans woman. And once she did, she appears to have lost both her family and her job as an engineer. Mock's reflection on this encounter underscores the potential for racialized socioeconomic advantages to actually inhibit the path towards coming to identify as trans, at least when it is still a relatively cutting edge identity, since there can be potentially more to lose. A position towards the top or towards the top of a social hierarchy can lead to more interference from others. In economist Deirdre McCloskey's case, who was the daughter of a Harvard professor and an artist, her sister, a professional psychologist, and her professional colleague, an economist, leveraged their credibility to, have, to attempt to have her involuntary committed once she came out. Relatedly, if one thing is not associated with being trans, it's going to college. And this was the case in the, my earlier article and continues to be the case now. What you're seeing here, I've checked like 500 times. It is not a coding error. Across all cohorts, it is actually people who have not attended college who identify as trans at significantly higher rates than people who did attend college. For whatever you know, woke agenda that is being pursued in college classrooms, it does not seem to be working. Uh, it could be one interpretation. One potential explanation, uh, an alternative one, uh, is that trans people also encounter so many obstacles in their K through 12 educational trajectories, making college less of a possibility for them than for people who are not trans. But it could also reflect this dynamic of having more to lose, especially when college is a form of a parental investment. I do not find any evidence to support Schreier's vision of college as a factory for turning people trans. 
But in going back to the tie-in to racialization, if we subset the data and just look at white respondents, and here the coding I'm using assigned sex assigned at birth, it's, it's just shorthand, it's assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth. Blue is assigned female, red is assigned male. And so what we are seeing here, this is among white respondents. Remember Schreier accused uh, specifically white transgender men of becoming so, so that they could shed their white privilege. Well, let's look at whether this pattern here persists when we look at other groups. Here we are looking at non-white respondents, um, and there is also an increase among non-white respondents in identifying as trans, in which the, the ratio, the traditional sex ratio, so to speak, has uh, flipped. And then this is among black respondents, and we can see that they're, they're, the movement here, even if the, there's still overlap in the 95% conf confidence intervals, the movement is overall in this direction. And this also seems to be the case if we look at Hispanic respondents. So to some extent, the racialized patterns we can observe with nine years of data from a pooled general health survey suggest that the traditionally advantaged group is the late adapter of a cutting edge gender identity. What is less clear is the dynamic that has become apparent in terms of sex assigned at birth. What does seem to be the case is that trans identity is some constant is not some constant. What does not seem to be the case is that trans identity is some sort of concentrated attempt to shed whiteness and grift in college. People across a broad spectrum of racial and economic and ethnic identities are identifying as trans in higher numbers. However, there's still a lot to think about in terms of the position of people who are assigned female at birth. This is one of the things that is, you know, continuing to puzzle me as I work on another chapter for this book, but it is, I think, one of the one of the scariest things to think about because this is the core of some of the biggest hype around this issue. And so there are a few a there are a few potential theory things to contend with. So up until if you read a lot of trans history, there's this point in the 1980s where people started saying, hey, where are all the trans guys? And magazines like FTM International and the Erickson's Foundation started providing more services to trans men. A lot of the early medical history was mostly focused on trans women. And so there is, you know, there have been an increase in the representation and the, the acknowledgement of trans men in the later half of the 20th century. But if you look at even in my own slideshow, many of the, 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 the faces of transgender social change we see on the covers of Time magazine on Vanity Fair are trans women. And my argument is that there's certainly not a, a huge glut of positive trans representation of trans men that could be driving some sort of mimicry or you know, a huge glut of role models. A second thing to contend with is this literature on the rise of women that is documented uh, in which women are beginning to outperform men in a lot of the traditional educational role. Uh, Princeton alum Joel Middleman has done some research that com complicates this a little. When we're looking at gender nonconforming girls, they are actually on the other spectrum of gender nonconforming gay boys uh, who have some sort of ec uh, uh, educational advantage. And so it's unclear where trans men lie in relation to this rise of women and gender nonconforming girls. They are not women or gender nonconforming girls. But a lot more needs to be done about, and a, a lot more needs to be looked at at how they might be facing some of these similar uh, crises or opportunities in education. Another thing, many of you might have seen uh, something in the news about an increasing polarization between young men and young women. This was actually kind of then revealed to be an artifact of the new GSS or the 2022 GSS, but there is some divergence overall in political values in, in across many countries. 
And so perhaps, you know, some of the biographical availability patterns uh, towards becoming trans in the 21st century are related to perhaps progressive political values or, you know, wanting to be a part of a social cause. And so these are things that I think are not necessarily sinister, uh, but that have to be evaluated as, as social. And um, so here are the takeaways of the talk, but these are the considerations that are, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, day and night. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to conclude with the takeaways. Um, first is that trans identity has not been and is not now exclusively white. Uh, and this is very important because the term, are you transgender in this, in many ways, it's it's a conservative estimate because there can be so many culturally specific terminologies that are not that are not going to lead someone to say I am trans. They might say I am Mahu, for example. So in some ways, this is a conservative estimate. But even among this very culturally specific term, the the historical pattern has been that it's been predominantly more non-white people who have identified as trans in, in higher rates than white people, at least until recently. Uh, the second point is that it's not a college educated thing. I want this finding to, you know, make it, uh, this is people who have ever attended college. So, but, you know, I think the, the pattern also holds, um, but it is a broad, you know, it's a broad group. This is people who have ever stepped foot on a college classroom. Even people who have ever stepped foot on a college classroom, even if it's to study engineering, for example, or take gender studies. I mean, we don't have data that specifically look at college majors, but it's not college necessarily. And it's not the, re the, the, you know, the imagined many, many resources and infinite ones for LGBTQ people. The third is that sex assigned at birth has been you know, a significant uh, change um and but it cannot be boiled down to or you know it need not be boiled down to ulterior motives often this idea of contagion really reflects this very simple contagion of hey like don't let that trans person in the classroom having a trans kid in your class is going to go person to person where if even if we want to use a loaded term like contagion it's far more complex and it's more within the realm of a mechanism that corresponds to the distribution of a social fact in the Durkheimian sense. But again, one not the one that need not be treated as sinister. Thank you very much. <laughs>